Oh my goodness, I can't Welcome wait. everyone. I'm Kim Crum of Women Who Write. And uh, tonight we are featuring uh, Lynn Flatter, who's gonna read to her from her new novel, uh, Lucretia's Song. So we're gonna hear from her in just a few minutes as we all gather. Women Who Write, just uh, because this is what I need to do, is a group that nurtures women's writing lives and welcomes all skill levels and genres and meets monthly. And it's a membership group. Every People are all welcome to come twice without being a member. And we meet the second Tuesday of every month. Soon we may meet in person, we hope. So welcome everyone, whether you're a a member, a prospective member of Women Who Write, or just here because you like Lynn. Those are all good enough reasons, right? So we are recording now. So anything you say could be held against you in a court of law since we're on the crime circuit tonight. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Lynn. Just... <laughs> Lynn's going to read from her book, Leisha's Song, tonight. Uh, the book is to be released on June 22nd. After her reading, Lynn will answer our questions about her writing and publication processes and whatever she pleases. Lynn serves as the president of Derby Rotten Scoundrels, the Ohio River, River Valley chapter of Sisters in Crime. She enjoyed a long career as a professional dancer and dance educator, earning her MFA in writing popular fiction from Seton Hill University in 2016. She writes coming of age romantic mysteries and is the author of It Should Have Been You, a Silver Falcon finalist, While I Danced, an epic finalist, and Leisha's Song published by Fire and Ice. Her short story, Missed Q, appears in Malice Domestic's 2020 anthology, Murder Most Theatrical. Lynn lives in Kentucky, actually, in Louisville, where she's at work on her next novel, Deadly Setup. So welcome, Lynn. Hey, oh. Take it from here. <laughs> well, thank you, Kim. And first off, I want to say how glad I am to be here with you all. And both of my sisters are here, which is very thrilling. Oh, really? uh, and as any of you who have sisters know how much that means to you, to have your sisters with you. Um, I wanna do three things before we open up to questions. The first thing I'd like to do is to share a short scene from Leisha's song with you. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about my journey to becoming a fiction writer. And finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about my writing process. And then we'll open it up to anything you wanna ask or, or comment on. So to set up the scene that I'm going to be reading to you, uh, Alicia, the central character of Alicia's song, is a young woman who's on scholarship at a New England boarding school. Her teacher goes missing and she's convinced that something is terribly wrong and she's got to find her teacher and make sure her teacher is okay. So Cody, a friend of hers, uh, insists on helping her and he appoints himself as her sidekick. And uh, they cook up a story to get into the teacher's apartment. And the story is that Leisha really needs to get some music that she's been working on with her, with her vocal teacher. She knows that Mr. Ainsley, their headmaster, would not want uh, them to be snooping around and would be very upset if he knew. But Leisha is very, very determined and she decides to risk this anyway. So at the beginning of this scene, she and Cody uh, just arrived at the apartment building. As it turned out, I didn't need to tell my story for us to get into Miss Wells' place on Sunday afternoon. We pressed the buzzer in the vestibule labeled super. Yeah, a gruff voice called out over the intercom. Hi there, we're from Stonefield. Can we come in and talk to you for a minute, I asked. Okay, I'll buzz you in, come on downstairs. He waited for us by his door. 
a short guy with heavy jowls and a bad comb over. He wore a torn red sock sweatshirt smeared with what looked like ketchup. A Patriots game blared from his television. The announcer screamed, touchdown! The guy wheeled around, pumped his fist in the air and screamed out, yeah, baby! He remained riveted on the screen while they showed the replay. Finally, he turned around and shot us an apologetic grin. Sorry about that. Guess you can tell I'm one of them diehard fans. You the people from Stonefield to pick up Miss Wells' stuff? Cody jumped in. We are. I'm Ricky and this is Lucy. Ricky? Lucy? I brought my hand up to my mouth to cover my grin. Bert Luongo, the super said, as he grasped Cody's outstretched hand. Apparently he wasn't an I Love Lucy fan. <laughs> Cody pumped his hand enthusiastically. I hate to interrupt you watching the game, but we wanted to look around first and see how many packing boxes we'll need. Can you let us in? Sure, hold on. He shot a longing look back at his television and grabbed his keys off a hook by his door. I already put a few boxes up there I had for you. Thank you so much, I said, as we followed him up the stairs to Miss Wells' third floor apartment. She was a nice lady, he said. Really surprised me that she took off so quick and didn't take her stuff. Did she tell you anything about where she was headed, I asked. Nope. Just left me a voicemail apologizing and telling me to keep her security deposit. Said to contact Mr. Ainsley about storing her stuff. Did she sound normal, I pressed? Well, now that you mention it, she sounded kind of nervous, like she was rushing, you know? I figured it must be something real serious, like maybe someone in her family was sick or had an accident. Nervous? My chest tightened. By the time we reached the third floor, Mr. Luanga was breathing hard. He unlocked the door and rested against it for a moment. Furniture stays, he said, comes with the place, but everything else goes. When he went back downstairs, I closed the door, glanced around, and swallowed hard. The lingering scent of Miss Wells' jasmine perfume wafted through the air. Lived kind of modestly, didn't she, Cody said? I didn't reply. Cody probably couldn't imagine living in a third floor furnished walk-up with a tiny kitchen and no dishwasher. To him, this probably seemed like a dump, but to me, it was perfect, at least twice the size of Gramps' place. And I loved the shawls she draped over the lamps, the posters of famous operas, and the candles and frame photos of her choirs that sat on top of her side table. Shelves crammed with books and CDs along with her sound system covered one whole wall of her living room. Her ancient upright piano stood in the opposite corner, piles of music stacked on top of it. Next to it, prominently displayed in a cabinet, was her grandfather's violin. I gaped at it. This couldn't be. Cody, I squeaked. He looked up from the round maple table at the far end of a living room where he was shuffling through a stack of books and papers. He shoved a small notepad into his pocket and rushed over. What is it? I gestured toward the cabinet. Her grandfather's violin is in there. Huh, that's a nice one. Looks like it was modeled after a Stradivarius. So? So when the choir was here in December, a bunch of us were talking about how awesome it was. And she told us her grandfather had left it to her. It's my most precious possession, she said. It's the one thing that always goes with me wherever I go. She never would have left it here. His eyes widened as he stared at me. Yeah? Just then, footsteps thudded on the stairs and grew louder. Mr. Ainsley's voice boomed out. I'll just have a look and see how they're doing. Oh, no. Come on, I whispered. Fire escape in the bedroom. We raced in there and frantically tried to open the window but it looked freshly painted and wouldn't budge. The footsteps drew closer. I rushed into the bathroom thinking maybe we could hide behind the shower curtain, but there was a see-through shower stall. 
the closet, Cody whispered as he pulled me away. We sprinted into the bedroom and managed to pull the closet door shut just as the apartment door creaked open. We dove behind a rack of clothes. My heart galloped. The squeak of snow boots echoed on the hardwood floors and then stopped. Was he in the bedroom where the carpet muffled the sound? Light spilled into the closet. He'd opened the door. I squeezed my eyes shut like a kid in trouble who wanted to believe that if she couldn't see anybody, then no one could see her. Seconds passed. The rack of clothes we hid behind was shoved aside. Reluctantly, I opened my eyes. Mr. Ainsley stood there with his hands on his hips, his lips pursed in a thin line. Well, if it isn't Lucy and Ricky, getting some good packing done in there? So that's the end of, of that uh, chapter of Leisha's song. And um, now I wanted to just uh, say a few words about my journey as a writer. Uh, when I returned to school to earn my MFA in writing popular fiction from Seton Hill University, I was in my mid sixties and I suffered from a terrible case of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every writer I met seemed to tell the same story. From the get-go, I knew I was meant to be a writer. As soon as I could hold a pencil, I was writing stories and poems and plays. Well, I was not a kid like that. My passion was dance. Whenever I heard a piece of music, I couldn't not move. And not surprisingly, I ended up with a long career as a modern dancer and a dance educator. That whole time that I was working in dance, my favorite group to work with was teenagers. And throughout my adult life, I continued to read and love young adult fiction. But as for writing it, I couldn't imagine that. I was sure I did not have the fiction gene. However, I did love to write. So while I was still dancing, I began taking some correspondence classes and magazine writing from the Writer's Digest School. And pretty soon I was moonlighting as a freelancer. I started writing about dance. And then um, later on, I wrote for regional parenting magazines and I specialized in writing about adolescents and the joys and challenges of parenting them. When age and injury led to my retirement from dance, I got this idea for a young adult novel that would feature an aspiring dancer who had a lot of romantic and family problems. Honestly, I think I started this project as sort of therapy for myself. I was grieving the loss of my identity and my life as a dancer and writing that book seemed like a way to stay connected to this world that I'd been in and had loved for so long. I did know, however, that I absolutely didn't know what I was doing. So I read a whole mess of craft books and I joined an SCBWI, that's the Society of Children's Book Writers um, and Illustrators, I joined one of their critique groups. And I worked on this novel off and on for several years. Finally, it seemed like it was ready to submit. So I did a bunch of research about uh, publishers who might be a good fit for this book. And I started submitting and Gee, I got a lot of rejections, probably enough to wallpaper my bathroom. But one day I got an email from the editor and publisher of a small press called Write Words, which unfortunately no longer exists. And the editor said she wanted to publish the book. I was beyond thrilled. I was 65 years old. I was starting grad school and this was my first published novel. So my message is, it's never too late. Um, at any rate, uh, of course, I continued on to write novels. I wanted to say a few words about uh, my writing process, because I always think it's interesting to talk to writers about their writing process. 
And one of the things that I have found is that I know a lot of really, really good writers. And everyone does it differently. Everyone's process is different. And so my philosophy is do whatever it works. Do whatever works for you. So I want to tell you what tends to work for me. First off, I get what Lisa Crone in her craft book, Story Genius, calls a wisp of an idea. And in the case of Leisha's song, the inkling of an idea came to me many years ago. I was standing in line in New York's Port Authority, and I was waiting to catch a bus to Connecticut. Nearby was a grandmother and a granddaughter. And being the nosy person I am, I was eavesdropping. And I soon realized that this young girl was headed off to boarding school for the first time and she did not want to go. She didn't want to leave her neighborhood and she had no interest in attending this fancy school with these uppity white kids. The grandmother would have none of that. She said to her granddaughter, you are smart, you are gifted, you have earned the scholarship and this is your shot for a better life. So that got me to thinking about what it would be like to be a whip smart young woman of color at a boarding school where the majority of students came from white wealthy families. Okay. So now I had the inkling of a character and I had a setting. So then I did what I always do, which is to spend an enormous amount of time thinking and writing about my character and the other principal characters in her world. Not just what they look like and how old they are, uh, but what their personalities are like, what their hopes and their fears are what their strengths as well as their foibles are. For me, the most essential thing is to dig deeply into their backstory and how that backstory has shaped who they are and how they view the world and their place in it. For example, in Leisha's song, she has grown up as more or less the stand-in for her late mother. Her father's not in the picture, her mother abandoned her as an infant and later died of a drug overdose. And she has grown up with her widowed grandfather, the only parent she's ever had. From the time she's been identified as academically gifted, her grandfather has poured every one of his deferred dreams onto her. He has a whole script laid out for her life. Get a scholarship to a prestigious New England boarding school, which she accomplished. Continue to excel academically, which she has. And then snare a college scholarship en route to medical school and becoming a physician. While Leisha has inherited her late mother's love of singing and her singing ability, her grandfather repeatedly impresses upon her that singing is fine as a hobby, but not as a career. He's also been adamant that she never get romantically involved with a white boy because he blames her mother's demise on a white man she got involved with at the nightclub where she was singing. For Alicia, there's been a lot of payoff in being the, her grandfather's golden child and replacement daughter. She loves her grandfather and he is enormously proud of her. She gets a lot of accolades for her academic accomplishments. It's never really been a problem for her to become, to be a pleaser. Right away from knowing about her background, all kinds of ideas for both internal and external conflicts spill out as I play the what if game. What if her experiences at boarding school cause her to feel extremely conflicted about following her grandfather's script for her life? What if she falls in love with classical singing and really wants to pursue music rather than medicine? What if 
despite her grandfather's dictums to leave it alone, she can't bear not to try to find her beloved mentor and vocal coach, who suddenly resigns and disappears in the midst of preparing her prize students for a vocal competition. What if she finds herself attracted strongly to another student, a sensitive cellist who happens to come from an ultra wealthy conservative white family? Suddenly, she's way out of her comfort zone and she has to figure out who she is and who she wants to be apart from her grandfather's script for her and what price she may have to pay for following her own path. She has to grow and change during the course of the novel and the stakes are high. If she continues to defy her grandfather, he may pull her out of school and she may lose the chance to be with her romantic interest and get a first class education. Moreover, she may even end up risking her life to find her missing teacher. I guess what I'm trying to say is that as mystery writer Elizabeth George advises in her craft books, if I start with character development, all sorts of plot ideas and complications will follow. But here's the caveat. I know lots of wonderful writers who don't do it that way. They get to know their characters in the process of writing their novels, and they would never dream of spending days and weeks thinking and writing about their characters beforehand. Are they doing it wrong? Absolutely not. It's whatever works. And the answer to that question will be different for every writer. Since I write mysteries, there are certain conventions and expectations of the genre that I have to keep in mind. Alicia is convinced that foul play is involved in her teacher's disappearance, and she's right. But for it to be a satisfying mystery, there has to be more than one person with a compelling motive for wanting to get rid of Alicia's teacher. There are several possible suspects. There's the headmaster who is having an extramarital affair with the teacher and who was risking losing his career and his marriage. There's the headmaster's wife who is very pissed at him for catting around with this teacher. There's a, a fellow student of Leisha's who's fallen madly in love with this teacher, but of course gets rejected by her. There's a faculty colleague who bitterly resents her ascendance to the chair of the department. There's also a daughter that the teacher gave up for adoption and she had her as a teenager. And this daughter went on to experience an extremely abusive childhood. So all of these people have a good reason to possibly want either to harm this teacher or get her to disappear. Before I begin a mystery novel, I usually know who the culprit really is amongst this array of suspects. But again, not all mystery novels work this way. Recently, I interviewed Victoria Thompson and she's the award-winning author of two historical mystery series. She told me that she figures out ahead of time who the victim is and who the possible suspects are. And she has no idea who the killer is until she starts writing the novel. And in the process of writing the novel, she along with her readers discover who the killer is. I loved that. She told me something else. She used to write historical romances. And she said for those, she would plot and outline and plan very carefully for her mystery novels. No, she is ready to go the minute she's got that victim and those suspects and she starts writing. And boy, does she write good books. So again, it's whatever works. In combining a romance with mystery, which is what I like to do, there needs to be a good reason for their romantic partners to spend time together. In Leisha's song, Cody appoints himself as her sidekick in the investigation. Cody is nobody's fool. He's been crazy about Leisha ever since they performed together in the fall. And he has figured out that if he can help her 
and spend a lot of time with her, that he will break down her resolve not to become romantically involved with him. And of course, as you well know, conflict is the lifeblood of fiction. And these two have plenty of issues and challenges as they deal with their strong attraction to one another. Obviously, this is a familiar Romeo and Juliet romantic trope. But fortunately, it doesn't have the same tragic ending. In all genres of young adult fiction, there is the expectation of some element of hope at the end. As YA romantic fiction writers like to say, at the end, the couple is HFN, happily for now. I often get asked whether I'm a plotter or a pantser, somebody who does very little pre-planning. I always think of myself as more of a plotter in the sense that I start with some sort of a general plan of what's going to happen and I sketch out my thoughts on scenes. Now, some writers, I know, very good writers, find it works to jump around and they write scenes out of order. They write the ones that interest them and they feel they have a good handle on. And then eventually they stitch all those scenes together. That just doesn't work for me because I work a lot on cause and effect. This happened and that made her feel this way. And then she did this and then this happened, et cetera, et cetera. Um, like many young adult writers, I write in first person. That's very, very common in young adult fiction. And for me, it makes me feel closer to my protagonist and what he or she or they is thinking and feeling. I always think of what Marion Bauer said once at an SCBWI writers conference. She said, put your protagonist in your imagination on the very top of your computer monitor. He or job is to stay very close to what your protagonist is thinking and feeling. Speaking of which, I find that internal dialogue, monologue rather, is very helpful because what our characters are saying often diverges significantly from what they are thinking and feeling from the inside. So those are a few of my thoughts about writing process. Writers, as I have said at least three or four times, all do their work in different ways, but there are some threads that working writers share in common. One is perseverance, and the other is a lot of butt in chair writing time. So now what I thought I'd like to do is to open it up to any of your comments or questions or anything you'd like to add to add to this. So do I have any brave? If you're ready, raise your hand and turn off your mute and ask. Okay. Oh, it's Susan. All right, Susan. Let me unmute. Uh, I'm curious uh, with your years of dance experience. Yes. What impact do you think or influence dancing, being a dancer, has on your writing? And I don't mean like, well, I like to write about dance people. I mean, for in a maybe a stylistic way or how you approach working, yeah. how, how it might influence you. I actually wrote a blog about that once um, because I think it's interesting because a lot of people think, oh, you were a dancer. How can you stand sitting hour after hour at a computer and writing? But the truth is I see a lot of similarities, Susan. Dance does require a lot of self-discipline. It requires a lot of perseverance. You are never done as a dancer. There is always more. You always have to shoot for more. You're always trying to grow and get better. I think both involve a considerable vulnerability. Uh, when you're up there on stage with hardly anything on, you are <laughs> you are exposing yourself and who you are and what you're about to the world. And I think to some extent we do that when we write. It's impossible not to reveal a lot about who we are from the choices we make as a writer. I also, um, I also think that dancers experience a lot of rejection. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of part of the life of a dancer. And so uh, maybe that prepared me, uh, even though uh, I, uh, as my sisters will tell you, I'm very sensitive and I go into my fetal position uh, after every uh, rejection and I have to uh, <laughs> lots of chocolate. <laughs> I don't know if that helps at all, but yes, me I, Okay, good. Um, I wanted to say first that I had the privilege and the pleasure of reading Leisha's song in draft. And to hear you read that section was so much fun. Oh. And I just want to thank you for that because I've seen you just grow so much as a writer and it's, it's pretty exciting to see your success. Um, that's my comment. And, and you've gotten, you use so many more active verbs. So yay. <laughs> Yes, Mary Lou, Mary Lou would really push me on that. <laughs> but, but I want, I want, wonder if you would share your, because you've had, you know, coming at this as a second career, yeah. you've had um, a good amount of success, a very much um, appreciated success at publishing. And I wonder if you talk for a few minutes about what it's like to, to get a book published, what the process has been, who's helped you get to that point where you're now what this is your third novel to be published if I'm right yeah I mean that's that's incredible so if you could share with us how what was the the highest and the lowest and and how did you um how did you boat yourself through that time oh gosh <laughs> I think I could write a book on that yeah well first of all a lot of people helped me along the way uh, and uh, two of them are here right now, Mary Lou and Mary Popham, uh, have uh, done a lot of critiquing of this manuscript. Also, my sisters in crime people here, Susan Bell and Nikki and Jeanette has looked at pieces of this and helped me. As far as getting published, um, a lot of it, I think, is research. Um, I really tried to do a lot of research. For one thing, I read a lot of comparable books. And then I looked at the acknowledgments, not only who's publishing this book, but who they are thanking. And you know, to get ideas of whom I might submit to. Of course, I did a lot of research on query tracker and, and you know, writer's market uh, listings of possible publishers. And then I set up a whole submission thing, you know, where I track who I've submitted to and what the response was and that kind of thing. It's, it's very arduous. Uh, I did have <clears throat> someone in grad school who said that if you don't get at least 100 rejections, you're a piker, you know, and he would actually uh, make a uh, make a goal for getting a certain number of rejections every year. He's an award-winning mm -hmm. story writer, but he wow. would say, oh, I'm behind on my rejections. I've got to submit more. And he kind of helped frame it in a way where I thought, this is just part of the business, you know, and it's not personal. And then eventually, if you keep on, as I said, here is the difference between pre-published and published writers. It is not talent. I'm convinced it is not talent. Not that talent doesn't help, all right? But the difference is that published writers just didn't give up. I mean, you just keep going until maybe you'll find that one publisher who will want your work. Now with the second book, it was very different because what happened was that the chair of Seton Hill's department sent all the alums and the faculty and the students this message that, oh, Page Street is gonna start a new imprint. And they've invited anybody who's interested to submit. At this, point, at this particular juncture, I had gotten about 70 rejections from agents, and I had about three agents who requested either partial or full manuscripts, but had not yet made a decision. 
Okay, so page street, I query page street, they really want, like the book, they want the book. I use that as leverage to get an agent. Oh, this person's really interested in this book. Don't you want, don't you want to take me on as a client? That's how I got my agent. It was backwards. Okay. After that book was published, I thought, oh, I'm on my way. I have an agent, I have a hardcover book, all is well, I'm going to ride off into the sunset as a successful writer. Well, guess what? I really, really wanted to write this book featuring a young person of color. And at that time in YA land, there was a huge, there still is actually a huge controversy over whether white people have any right to be writing about characters of color. So the first thing that happened was my publisher refused to even consider the manuscript. You are not own voices. I'm not going to look at them. Mm. The next thing that happened is that I lost my agent in a dispute over uh, whether she was willing to submit the book to anybody. I would say that was a fairly low point. Uh, I felt like, holy guacamole, uh, you know, this is not good. But then mm -hmm. I was kind of soured on the agent idea. The other thing about that particular agent I had is that one time she said to me, do you have to keep writing about people in the arts? I mean, can't you make your characters not be interested mm -hmm. in the arts? Well, you know, that's, that's what I knew. That's what I was passionate about. And I thought, no, I can't really do that. So uh, I, she just probably wasn't the right agent. But anyway, the next thing that I did was research small publishers who did not require an agent. And I did my research and uh, again, I queried. I got dozens of rejections, but by the time I signed with Fire and Ice, there were four or five small publishers who expressed an interest. Again, I feel it was just perseverance. Um, it was just getting up and, and continuing to try. And then a really nice thing happened uh, recently, which is that this small publisher, Fire and Ice, has already come, uh, accepted for publication my fourth novel, which is oh. really set up. Yes. So I thought <laughs> there is a God. Uh, but, um, but, you know, seriously, I mean, it's just, it's such a crazy business. It's just a crazy, crazy business. And I feel like the only thing we can do is keep going and keep putting our work out there and keep improving it and committing to growing as writers. But just don't give up. That's my philosophy. Don't give up. I don't know if that answers your question, Mary Lou. Absolutely. Thank you. More than answers. So okay. thank you very much. All right. Great storytelling. So Holly, you don't have your mute button on. Did you have a question? I don't, sorry. <laughs> but thank you, I, this was okay. very informative. All right, okay, good. All right. Good question. Thank you, Holly. Pam. Pam, I see Pam. Pam. There's Pam. Hi, hi Lynn. Um, Pam. I'm curious how you went about um, you said you had a blog. I assume you have a website. You probably have a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. How did you navigate putting all that together? Okay. Good. First of all, I, I have an admission to make. I'm not a digital native. I'm older than dirt and I'm a technophobe. So, <laughs> so what I did, honestly, what I did was uh, hire author bites to uh, do my website, Pam. Now I do all the content, you know, and my blog is on my website. So I do everything, you know, I write the stuff about the novels and I write the blogs and I interview guest authors and I do that stuff. But honestly, Pam, I, I know zillions of authors who just zippity zap, they go on WordPress or some other platform and they do a beautiful job of putting together their website. And I just, it just wasn't part of my skill set. So I decided to invest in asking somebody to help me. So that's what I did. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to? Yes, Nancy. Yeah. Nancy? I'm new, I'm new to writing and it's not a full time profession. Yes. 
I'm curious how you set your goals. Did you give yourself a word goal for a day or a week? Did you give yourself a timeline for completion? Tell me what your process was. <clears throat> oh dear. <laughs> Because I always try to give myself a word count. You know, I aim for about 1,500 uh, words a day. And I how long that take I have you? friends who do like 10,000 words or whatever. And then I have friends who say a good day is 500 words a day or whatever. I try to give myself a goal, uh, Nancy. But you know what? Sometimes I'll make these elaborate schedules of what I'm going to do that week. And I plot out all the available hours and everything. And there is invariably something that happens that I did not anticipate. So uh, everything takes longer than I thought, than I think it's going to. So that's all I can say. But you just have to keep going. And how long on average does 500 words take you? Are you fluent? Do you write quickly? Or sometimes 500 words take you? A long time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, there are a lot of writers. Again, this goes back to process. I know a lot of writers who say, write a messy first draft. Just go through and don't worry about how it looks or how it sounds or whatever. And that's how you do it. I can't work that way. Mary Popham can't work that way. We tinker, we tinker, and we tinker, and we tinker. Um, and um, every day, I will tell you that I start by reviewing the pages I've written from the day before. And then that helps me get back into it. And even then, I'm making changes. Uh, and I continue to, to, to tinker. I think it takes a long time. I, I'm just not quick. And I know, I know many people who are, who are much quicker than I am. Uh, Ellen Burkett Morris, who's a good friend of, of several of us here, wonderful writer. And she always says, um, keep your eyes on your own page. Because if you start comparing yourself to other writers, that's death. Uh, in fact, I once wrote a blog about how to make yourself miserable as a writer. And that's a biggie, is comparing yourself to all the people you know who are much more successful or more talented or write more quickly than you do. Um, and that's a definite, definite way to, to drive yourself crazy. So, then may I ask one more question? Yes, Nancy. What writing tool do you use? Like, do you, use, do you handwrite? Do you use a program? I use Word. I just use Microsoft Word. That's the only program I use. I know some writers use Scrivener and, there are, and different writing software. Some writers write in longhand. Now I will say that sometimes when I'm just sitting there trying to sketch out what I want to have happen in the next chapter, I'll sit in the chair in my office and I will handwrite and I will scribble. But when it actually comes to writing scenes, I, I definitely am writing them on the computer. And I have to say that when I started writing, this is how old I am, we didn't have computers. <laughs> and uh, I tell you what, I mean, it was something. If you decided to make a change, oh my goodness, you know, and now it's just a wonderful cut, cut and paste. Mm -hmm. best friend and we mm -hmm. can just you know move all these things around and I I don't know how we ever did anything uh but somehow we did and we wrote on something called a typewriter um so it was so very different mm -hmm. I'm in my 70s Nancy and it was very very different when when I was young Typewriters are coming back like LPs are, you know. I know, I heard that. They're very popular, yes. I heard that. Yeah, Mary, do you have a question or a comment? You have to unmute yourself, dear. Mary? There's. Okay, there yeah, I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Lynn, I know um, your right family there. is in New York and other states and yeah. I'm one, and our craft books have told us about going to different places for research. Yes. So, have you done that? And if so, where, what, uh, what places have, where have you gone to do research? I probably haven't done nearly enough, uh, enough research. Um, 
in terms of going places. For the first book I did, uh, While I Danced, because the, <coughs> the um, protagonist was from Camden, Maine, and uh, a very wonderful dance teacher happened to land there in this fairly small touristy community in Maine. So I actually went to Camden and uh, got a lot of flavor from doing that. And then uh, I also, my sister Lucretia um, lives in Cambridge. So she, this, this character goes to uh, school, dance, a dance workshop in Boston. So I kind of, you know, we would drive by the Boston School of Ballet and I remembered, I lived in Cambridge as a young person. I remembered studying at some of these places in, in Boston, so. But I don't, I, I don't do enough. Now I will say, it's amazing what you can find um, it, on Google. Mm -hmm. It really is. Because yeah. sometimes I'll look up, oh, you know, uh, I wanna really know, uh, what's happening in particular communities, and what the restaurants are, or what the schools are, or what the streets are, or what the architecture is like, and that kind of thing. And I will look a lot of that stuff up on Google, but I'm not much of a traveler. And the reality is, as my sisters will tell you, my husband is a homebody. So getting him even out of the house is like this major, major deal. So um, it's, it's uh, the only times I travel are generally to see my sisters and my grandchildren. Uh, and I'm often by myself. So he just is not a traveler. Okay. Does anybody else have a husband or partner like that? Or oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a brother-in-law who loves to travel and would <clears throat> go anywhere and be on the, uh, you know, travel anywhere all the time. So if we could just put them, sort of make a, make a, a husband in the middle, we'd be, we'd be all set. The important thing probably is that you like to travel because then there's all yes. those events someday yes. soon. Yes, reading books. And um, so I wanted to say one thing and then wrap it up with some information about where we can buy your book and where okay. we can see you next. Um, I, uh, first of all, I admire you for, for writing about young adults. I was thinking today, and while I sent out a, a, a writing prompt to everybody to, to, to remember a coming of age problem, um, I thought, you know, I have, I, I have trouble writing about my adolescence. You know, there's something psychotherapy would, would help me with that. But okay. it's one of the diffi most difficult, because I think it's such an uncomfortable time in your life. So I guess I'm wondering you how you get into the youthful head, the, the coming of age head. I know you're writing the mysteries and love is love for, mm -hmm. for now, right? But how do you get into that youthful psyche? Well, it helps to never grow up. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's helpful. I think it's also helpful just to hang out with teenagers. Um, hmm. I used to uh, <clears throat> work at the Youth Performing Arts School on the dance faculty. And then for seven years, I was the counselor at Governor's School for the Arts. Oh. That helped me a lot. <laughs> and in addition, I am a comprehensive sexuality educator on a volunteer basis. And I work with teenagers. So that helps me get into that mindset because I hang out with a lot of teenagers. Um, so yes. I guess, I guess it's just, I don't know. You answered my yeah. question better than I expected anybody ever could. So that was really good. Yeah, so, uh, so tell us where, when, when your book is coming out, where we can buy it and where we can hear you next. Okay. Uh, right now it is, this is a very long story. Um, Right now, I think it's already available on Amazon, oh. uh, both in paperback and in, um, what do they call it, Kindle. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of an interesting thing because in order to get advanced copies of the book for book reviews, it actually says it was printed in February, but it was not, did not become available until June. So it is now up. Uh, so I don't know that June 22nd publication date kind of 
drifted off into fantasy land or something because you can actually go on Amazon and uh, get this book. So, uh, and my next visit is, I think, is to Bard's, um, Bard's Corner Writers Group. I think it's in Bardstown. I'm not sure, but um, I think I'm doing that next week. So I'm excited about that. I'm also going to be on something called YA Book Chat, which is an online thing. And I don't know what else I'm going to do, but um, pray for me that it goes that it goes well, because there's so many thousands of books every year that that get published, and you just hope that you'll you'll find some readers. So, yeah, and check out Lynn's uh, website, which is what lynnslatter.com. Yes. Okay, that's easy enough, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. So, yeah. thank you for this segment for coming to to us for this segment of our Women Who Write meeting, and you're all welcome to stay, including you, Lynn, or you're welcome to say farewell. But for now, let's just. Clap our hands. Thank you. Arthur, great job. I'm gonna I'm gonna hop off here because I actually have